Um, I think uh, the next talk will give us a very interesting historical or almost, I would say, prehistoric or transhistoric dimension of this question. Um, uh, it, it, uh, our next speaker is uh, Michna Mircan, uh, who is a curator and writer. Uh, from 2005 to 2006, he was the curator of Le Pavillon Palais de Tokyo in Paris and cu curated numerous projects at the National Museum of Contemporary Art in Bucharest. Um, at the moment, he is uh, 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 living and working in Antwerp as the artistic director of the Extra City Kunsthal uh, Antwerp, where in 2011 he curated, um, uh, among other projects, one-on-one uh, -on -one Hans van Heuvelingen and Jonas Stahl. So Jonas and uh, Michna have worked together and are currently collaborating on a new project uh, uh, called uh, the group, uh, it, it's the group uh, exhibition, uh, the allegory of cave, the cave painting. And t uh, Michna's talk today will focus on the, the, the context of uh, this exhibition and uh, elucidate a very interesting story about cave paintings and prehistoric art that could be seen as a, an example of a beyond of contemporary art at the same time, a prehistory that is contemporary and constantly with us. So. I give the floor to Michna. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for, for the introduction. Thank you very much to the organizers for um, the invitation to speak here. Um, if Jonas's um, reflective step back was intensive and, and brilliant, uh, mine will be extensive, as already announced. It's an examination of the material and symbolic ties between us and prehistory. Prehistory is, I think you will agree, formerness itself. My talk and um, the exhibition project that it functions as a preamble for is, is inspired by a recent archaeological discovery, a first account of which appeared in Antiquity, a quarterly review of world archaeology. But where I will quote in extenso from a later version um, of, that, of that text posted on the BBC Science and Environment website, which is less abundant in technicalities. Excuse me. Less abundant in technicalities, but sufficiently eloquent to function as a starting point for this interrogation, as a location shot for the various distances and disparities that push and pull at this text. Begin quote. A particular type of ancient rock in Western Australia maintains its vivid colors because it is alive researchers have found. While some rock art fades in hundreds of years, the Bradshaw art remains colorful after at least 40,000 years. Jack Pettigrew of the University of Queensland in, in Australia has shown that the paintings have been colonized by colorful bacteria and fungi. These biofilms may explain previous difficulties in dating such rock art. Professor Pettigrew and his colleagues studied 80 of these Bradshaw rock artworks in 16 locations within Western Australia's Kimberley region. They found that the vast majority of these showed signs of life, but no paint. The team dubbed the, pheno the phenomenon living pigments. Living pigments is a metaphorical device to refer to the fact that the pigments of the original paint have been replaced by pigmented microorganisms, Professor Pettigrew explained. These organisms are alive and could have replenished themselves over endless millennia to, express, to explain the freshness of the painting's appearance. Among the most frequent inhabitants of the boundaries of these artworks was a black fungus. Successive generations of fungi grow by cannibalizing their predecessors. That means that if the initial layer of paint from tens of thousands of years ago had spores of the fungus within it, the current fungal inhabitants may be its direct descendants. 
The team also notes that the original paint may, may have had nutrients in it that kick-started a mutual relationship between the black fungi and the red bacteria that often appear together. The fungi can provide water to bacteria, while the bacteria provides carbohydrates to the fungi. The suggestion of these living pigments may explain why attempts to date rock art, this particular site of rock art, have, have so far shown inconsistent results, somewhere between 40,000 years ago and last week. Although the paintings may be ancient, an ancient the life that fills their outlines is quite recent. It also explains how they maintain chromatic vivacity under inauspicious circumstances, as most of these paintings are actually outside caves, at their entrances, under changing meteorological conditions. Dating individual Bradshaw art is crucial to any further understanding of its meaning and development, Professor Pettigrew adds. Another rock art expert added that there's consensus that, we're looking at, that what we're looking at might not purely be pigment as it was applied when the depictions were made, but that studies like this one would help archaeologists worldwide take into account the effects that life itself may be having on the art. It's very interesting and very exciting what, what they're showing, that there is some form of microorganism going into the pigment and not destroying them, this later expert told BBC News. There appears to be a great variety of microorganisms when all samples were considered, but the black pigmented fungus was most prominent. It belongs to an extremely conservative group of rock-adapted fungi that replicate by devouring their predecessors in situ, which could explain why the sharp contours of Bradshaw art have not been corrupted by fungi growing beyond the edges of the image. We saw very rare examples where rogue fungi appear to have destroyed most of the painting. But in 98% of the cases, the fungi stayed strictly within the boundaries of the art. The mechanisms by which the microorganisms are confined within the edges of the painting notably include etching as much as a few millimeters into the level of the surrounding rock. So there are channels engraved into the stone to hold the painting together and contribute to its stability. I end my quote here. With the Bradshaw art, we seem to be addressed from the very depth of time, from an originating event to which our attention lends a kind of totality and a sense of destination. There is symbiosis between elements, but also between gesture and the, and the, and the materials that gesture is applied to, and which sets them into permanent motion. But there is also an immediately perceived difficulty, a discrepancy between this complex construction, this ecology, perfect ecology of purposes and results, this process of self-assimilation and rejuvenation, and the dark void to which prehistoric art is confined by conventional art history. A void that is interrupted by flashes, moments of intuition and serendipity, or any other figure of temporary illumination, which in concert and over time build up the ampler metaphor of the dawn of consciousness. Something is, a, is amiss at Kimberley, and our instruments of inquiry fail to grasp their target. Our metaphors and metonyms harden before they can apprehend their object. They feel devoid of sensuous force. Conventionally, I would say that the prehistoric object is exalted, so a prefabricated question can be asked of it, to be immediately met with a grandiloquent answer. Yet in relation to paintings that de demand absolutely nothing of us, to whom our spectatorship is only an inconsequential event, the grandeur that art history normally instills in what it scrutinizes would function as a kind of perjury. These images are brimming with time. They bubble with the material equivalent of the passage of time, which seems to be their principal nutrient. Shall we say nothing in response to the silent self-rejuvenation of the Bradshaw paintings, to the wordless invitation they address to us? Are we addressed at all by them? As we know, nothing is really nothing to art history, for nothing is interpreted either as the, as the diaphanous itself in an atmospheric sense, or as a secret yet to be unveiled. And silence is interpreted only as a riddle, a missed chance for disciplinary verbosity, for the interjections of elucidation. 
there is nothing in the territory patrolled by art history that does not aspire to be plenitude, want to be recuperated, demonstrated, and made almost tangible. Nothing that had not hoped, with varied degrees of success, to be an epiphany. All these instruments which write the past to the same extent that they write distance between the past and us feel inadequate here at Bradshaw. A critic said that art history is full of adverbs, adverbs that modulate the interaction between critical eye and the shapes, details, and resistances of the object it engages. But there are no resistances or details here and there is no residue of the chemical exchange that keeps the paintings in a state of permanent animation. Their economy is one of perfect self-administration, and through that, they dispense fully with museological care. It's probably useful to remember here that, that the reason why Lascaux II, the exact replica of the original site of Lascaux I, by contrast, Lascaux II was built precisely because of the microorganisms that were brought into the cave um, by the transit of, of, of visitors and their potentially deleter deleterious effects on the original paintings. Dispensing with museological care, um, these paintings at Bradshaw are, if we were to conflate the two meanings of the word, their, 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 their own reproduction. Excuse me. So I have a pair of twinned questions that I'm afraid will, will ramify into a litany as we go along. Um, this is very much in progress. This is um, a, a preparation um, for the exhibition project that, that David uh, quickly mentioned. Um, in response to this paradoxical encounter, I want to ask this. Is this an end or is this a beginning? Um, secondly, I want to ask, how do we curate the Bradshaw paintings? And then, to a certain extent, in, in response to, to Jonas, in distant response to Jonas, how do we occupy Kimberley? The place where their destiny seems to be already in full throttle, rather than awaiting us to provide it with an interpretive terminus point, with clarification and archival destination. Of course, all this, stem, all, all this stems from a very specific choice. I make the choice not to dismiss this as an accident, as the quirky, unforeseen, almost anecdotal outcome of the desire to just make a painting. That is supported by the evidence that, that this is perhaps not an accident, but the, the element of choice is, is nonetheless crucial. It is, I believe, important to speculate on what intentionality, full knowledge, can bring to this enigmatic mix of substances and desires, a mix of and a switch between matter and sense, an oscillation between meaning matter and materialized sense. The immediate consequence of this choice, if this instance of prehistoric art knew perfectly well what it was doing, is that this instance of prehistoric art must be equipped with a prehistory of its own. One that it perhaps ends as its culmination, in the, same end that, in the same way that we are the culmination of our own prehistory, or one that it rechannels into other temporalities, going towards us and away from us, other temporal distances that complicate the story of the advent of the visible, the moment where it all started, when the visual world came into visibility in a bizarre loop with itself is situated halfway between mimesis and self-representation, to be maybe understood as the mimesis of self-representation, or in later terms, as a self-portrait of the self-portrait. The task is perhaps to take distance as condition and not as impediment, not as delay of proximity. Distance not as separation to be breached in order for object and its disciplinary translation to overlap, enliven each other and dissolve in a Pygmalion-like kind of embrace. So how, without the means of poetry, to allow a secret to be a secret, divulged and held in simultaneous gestures by the paintings at Bradshaw, but also respond to that secret's delicate solicitation, its gentle arrest of our attention. As an aside, I would like to mention another recent discovery in the South African cave of Blombos of what appears to be a painting kit that has been dated as being 100,000 years old. A smaller anecdote within that story is that this painting kit 
contains recipients, and those recipients are now the oldest recipients that we know, receptacles. So the oldest receptacles that we know of were receptacles for holding and mixing pigment and not for holding water. A one page and a half news report on this uh, recent discovery features no less than seven occurrences of the word modern in relation to cognitive advancements and to the capacity of people 100,000 years ago to use substances in a symbolic way. This is a painting kit because all the chemical, material and gestural stages in the making of the picture, the application of paint on a body, on, on, on a wall, on, on animal skin, are transcribed in the orderly sequence of these muted, stilled objects. So used in the order in which they were abandoned, although that, that term is something that, that needs to be discussed, they would have facilitated something that is not there, an absence that allows two distinct kind of imagine, kinds of imagination. And I will return to this point in a second. First, I want to note that this is another temporal breach, so that the question of modernity that, that I posited artificially as, uh, as a 40,000 year old question is now a 100,000 year old question. The question is, the question of when we started becoming who we are now keeps receding into the past with all these new finds, so that our modernity is posed a progressively larger, older, and more intricate question of its own sources, of the cause and effect that led to the first cause and effect, which is a chronological, perhaps, the chronological converse of the messianic destiny that modernity has abandoned, discarded. The emergence of the modern soul keeps being delayed into the past. This is a kind of paleo-modernity or petro-modernity. Modernity petrified and, and enlivened permanently. Modernity petrified like Orpheus and revived, extracted from or sculpted into earlier and earlier stones, a forensic exercise of discovering and planting evidence so that the scene for an awakening for, from the moment, for the moment when the modern soul began to coincide with itself is fully clarified. I will return to the question of uh, the two kinds of imagination that that painting it, um, encourages or allows. To postulate that the Bradshaw artist did not know what he or she were doing would be consonant and detrimental, I would argue, with a traumatic reading of the painting kit at Blombos suggesting that something, danger, terror, loss, disorientation, the forces of nature or a very large animal intervened between the painter and the task of painting. What if at Blombos the painter simply did not paint for reasons other than inability, the reason, reasons that we, we, we cannot fully grasp, that, but we might be able to allow to exist beyond our grasp. Can we allow him or her that privilege of not functioning dutifully within our productive mindset? Or must he or she be forever captive in the sorrowful, sorrowful violent event that halted that painting's existence? And that equates, fundamentally, the evidence of a very old set of instruments with the absolute necessity of a painting. Are we therefore conditioned to ventriloquize our ancestors, to save them from aimlessness and or misapprehension, and teach them to feel, think, and speak, to make sure that they listen so that our present can begin to murmur, to rehearse its phrases, dreams, and provisional conclusions in the past. So how do we curate the Bradshaw paintings? Um, juxtaposition is one easy way, and imaginary juxtaposition is what I will propose here with help from two examples. Both examples are like the Bradshaw paintings, which can be, of course, shown, but, but nothing then, then indicates what I've, been, what I've been talking about. My two other examples are equally immune to reproduction. They are immune to reproduction and beyond it for very different reasons and within very different technological regimes. My first example is an allegory of spectatorship, and it might have something to say about how we look back at mythical beginnings and their foundational role. The image I cannot show now is the martyrdom of St. Catherine, painted in 1506 by Lukas Kranach. The highest resolution image I could um, 
obtained from the collection in Budapest where this painting is held conveyed nothing of the visual mechanism of the work. So I'll do my best to describe it, although as you will see the, the, the ekphrasis that, um, that will, will attempt that should be doubled by and cancelled out finally by noises and whispers. The understated voluptuousness and anatomic incongruities, which are, of course, as we know, the trademarks of Kranach, are there in this painting. But they are accompanied by the painted certainty, by the painted evidence of their impending disappearance or expiration. As is the case with a lot of Kranach paintings, anatomic incongruities are, are very um, awkwardly, but also endearingly, endearingly negotiated. If St. Catherine of Alexandria would stood up, she would easily crush her executioner, yet she surrenders to her destiny to become a martyr. Her execution is backgrounded by a variety of figures, shielding themselves from divine wrath. God is angry with the martyrdom. And this is where the story, the actual story of the painting begins. The blue sky is ripped open, and it reveals a pitch black nothingness that is about to, it is about to consume the world. The wheel on which St. Catherine is to be tortured explodes, cracks open, and bursts into flames and smoke. This annihilation of the instrument and place of torture is paradoxically simultaneous with the blotting out of the painting itself. Kranach paints a layer of ash that is about to settle progressively on the screen through which we seem to view the painting that will render in a predictable future uh, the painting absolutely invisible. A layer of ash rendered as an aggressive act of erasure, an attempt to cross out any apprehension. The shower of gray ashes that, that, that intervenes between us and the scene and that blots out the apocalyptic scene. These multiplying blots that cover the scene and do not register in the reproductions um, are completely discontinuous stylistically with how the rest of the painting is, is executed. It comes very close to an act of, of, of self-vandalism and it comes very close to an expressionist gestural attack of what is otherwise a pristine painting. The now that the painting knots together by bringing, by, by collapsing into each other, the future death of Saint Catherine and the present obliteration crosses out every being on the scene and also denies any possibility of articulating the scene itself. We have arrived to the painting in a kind of contradictory now between a too soon and too late. We're in the pictorial nick of time. There is enough evidence of Kranach's mastery and enough evidence of the painting's progress towards a gray gestural monochrome. The scene and its obfuscation are demonstrated and balanced calibrated to show how two temporalities can cohabit the image. When two temporal perspe perspectives are superimposed within a single frame, what results is probably a temporal anamorphosis. Although with modern instruments, we could also refer to it as, as a film still, a collage of film still from two different films or the superposition of two projections. Like the Bradshaw artists, Kranach paints anti-mimetic space where past and future do not function as each other's uninterrupted conduit. The life of the Kranach painting stands like that of the Bradshaw art outside the discourse of art incarnate, of art in permanent pursuit of, the, of enlivened resemblance. This Pygmalion complex, a desire for likeness and embodiment that runs through centuries of art and haunts its, its critics or historians, the phantasm of a work stepping out of the frame or down from its pedestals and into life. It runs, of course, from Zeuxis to, to Balzac's unknown masterpiece and all the way to Pollock and the performances that occupied the arena left vacant by, by abstract expressionism and perhaps all the way to the politically engaged practices of today. There is another quality to the Bradshaw paintings which I think allows me to invite a third participant to this imaginary exhibition. If the Pratcho paintings are still lives in real time and detonate the discourse of plenitude, of fragments made whole and wholes impersonated that animates art history and the museological mindset in a kind of disciplinary or institutional trompe l'oeil, 
And this idea of plenitude broken, in, broken into myriad sequences, into myriad instances of becoming and sameness made me think of, of Mexican artist Teresa Margolias, whose practice in general um, I, evokes, I confess, uh, rather ambivalent feelings. But there is one work that I want to mention. It is again beyond reproduction for reasons that I will clarify in a second. It has been installed in a variety of places, but the incarnation I, I, I saw, the iteration that I saw was at Museon in Bolzano, and this is important because this building is, is conceived as a transparent temple of communality. Uh, it is erected by a bridge that separates the two communities, Italian and German, that make the fabric of the city and that are, are in, in dispute, even if not, not very vocal dispute. So the museum functions as a window for the reciprocal examination and reconciliation. Wherever in the construction process a wall could have been replaced by a plate of glass, this architectural sublimation has happened. So we are in a, in a glass house whose transparency should in principle not be hindered. The work I will refer wields all the tropes that Margolius's art is famous for. Uh, but if these tropes images or, or fragments of brutality brought, imported like commercial goods from Mexico City or Ciudad de Juarez and reassembled in an art space that is repurposed as a museum for civil and social unrest are in all other cases that I'm aware of alarmingly or overwhelmingly present, often to the detriment of the work, here they register as the faintest obstruction, as a thin veil of translucence that interrupts the democratic metaphors of the place. Windows of the museum, the, muse the museum in Bolzano, were rubbed gently over time, weeks, with t-shirts, used, dirty, anonymous t-shirts brought from Mexico. This activity left indistinct smudges of sweat, grease, bacteria on the glass. This was an infinitesimal intrusion in the mutual visibility that ensures the multicultural functioning of the city. This was the film of a distance in both senses of the word. Film as a somewhat alien surface, an addition, a disquieting surplus, but also film as a function of framing and the dynamic montage. A film like the film of Ash, setting on the surface of the Cranach painting, and the film of its becoming obscure, of which we, ca we catch the doubly climactic point. Margolis's work was finally a metonym for an immense number of selves, the cells of conf conflict and immigration, death and violence, drug wars and precariousness, displacement and grim statistics, registering an in, in an entirely alien space through a distant imprint of their muscular activity, their thwarted mobility, their incapacity to extract themselves from uncomfortable or threatening situations, and their spastic gestures towards a dimly perceived exterior point. Their gestures of agonizing resistance were conjoined into a mass of bodies, smearing, entangling with each other, a whirlpool of limbs and movements installed like the very remote sound of what might be a cascade or the roar of collective struggle. If the intervention succeeds, it does so because it, it does not provide those bodies. It translates them as sweat, grease, and bacteria, and does not provide those bodies with kind of sanitized, spurious, artistically constructed, sustained and negotiated identities. The individual testimony, what could have been an individual set testimony or a dizzying collection thereof, is replaced by distant imprint and oxidizing smudge, blotting out with grease the interstices between two bodies, interiorities confused in the formless and the viscous. Globalization, which is, in a sense, powerfully evoked in, in Margolius's work, is one of the lo one locus for the unbridled allegories of today, whose prolifer proliferation was facilitated to an extent by the transparent political allegory of an end to history. Our, our world brims with unsolicited images. It implodes under their cumula the accumulated weight and speed of their transfers and substitutions. Asking the question of occupation, allegory, attention, and imagination, I wonder what the more and the less, as they are manifested at the Bradshaw art, uh, can add or subtract from that mass to and from this spectral equivalent of our world. I will look for help in different direction at the risk of reducing the, 
these authors to aphoristic versions of themselves, but with the potential benefit of quickly identifying a few antidotes to genealogical imagination, the overarching discourse that performs a permanent transportation between things and the ideas they seem to stand for, origins and ends, playing same to the other's other and muting contradiction. These partial answers come from three archaeologists. The first is Christopher Whitmer, who speaks of symmetrical archaeology. This is an agnostic exercise, which strives to allow entities to define and frame themselves, which grants dignity to all participants to a, to a given situation. To be symmetrical is exhausting, a necessarily infinite task that looks for a past coextensive with the practices that produce it then and now. Every year more pasts are gathered into the present through the heritage industry, but also via contemporary art. A plethora of pasts is produced continuously by art and marketing, but do these articulate a sense of belonging, of the present being the intertwined consequence of all those pasts, or rather a radical exoneration from the obligations that these pasts hold up to us? Art's response to the global, either as a cross-section through contemporary mutations, geopolitical or otherwise, or as the sum of artistic events that seek to be at least as numerous as these mutations, so that no calamity or injustice will go without its biennial, poses a similar problem. South African archaeologist David Lewis Williams takes contention in his revolutionary text, The Mind in the Cave, with the ex nihilo moment when a brain became a brain the transubstantiation through which thinking matter is achieved, concomitant with the moment when matter itself stopped thinking. The masks at Altamira, hijacking intelligence from the shapes of the rock, the animals depicted at Nio, taking exquisite advantage of the peculiarities of the rock on which they are painted, a preoccupation with the acts of touching the stone, of caressing the stone with hands or lips, with blowing pigment against it to create an organic communion as manifested in the negative handprints, or to conjure animals that seem to jut out of the wall of the caves that, uh, that Williams looks at. Thinking around the topography of the cave, uh, thinking through the, the top topography of the cave, an elaborate choreography of rituals, torches, shadows, and shamanistic acts, all this amount to a kind of sensuous sociology of the epoch, or perhaps to a never explicitly stated iconology of prehistory. While it strives to restrict its use of metaphors only for the gaps, of, uh, the gaps and, and, and holes that it points out in other discourses, Doubling the mind in the cave permanently with the cave in the mind, the study cannot avoid what seems to be a truly inescapable fallacy. Inescapable, yet one that, yet a fallacy that the example of the Brett Show paintings urges us in ways that are both delicate and relentless to reconsider. Taking into account Williams' title, the mind in the cave cannot be but ours, with the cave as origin and thus as terminus point. The counter-argument formulated at the Bradshaw site is that there is perhaps another mind that we have lost, forgotten, or written our way out of. My third archaeologist is Plato, um, specifically the passage in the Republic where Socrates doubts that children can distinguish between what is allegory and what is not, and that a pedagog pedagogy based on the former is tenable. He proceeds to tell monosyllabic Glaucon another story, a real allegory this time, which is the famous allegory of the cave. This parable is real rather than purely allegorical because it is in some way an attempt of writing a prehistory, an anteriority from which Olympian gods are absent, not there in order to grant legitimacy or descent. Of course, the allegory of the cave is, is a political rather than mythological scenario, an atheistic one too, but a foundational myth nonetheless, with another sign instead of the godly emblem. Plato's, Plato's shadow theater and the liberation from it that leads to knowledge is meiotics in reverse gear. It extracts a cause from an effect and inquires into the origins, rather, in, into origins rather than ideals. It is a downward move one that theatricalizes the first cause in ways not unlike those used by David Lewis Williams, whom I've quoted earlier, but also 
and that's I guess its main political charge, it strikingly refuses, strikingly refuses to concede that reason was born when Pallas Athena was excised from her father, father's divine head. It could be argued that, that Plato's cave is now inside out and that we live and work in a convex cave uh, traversed by an abundance of allegories. So how do we frame them since uh, we no longer have access to the concave framing of the Bradshaw paintings, to a technology that holds pictures together so that their perpetual activity would repel any allegorical misreading, uh, politically instrumentalized or not, any reading of them as other than themselves. Of course, by allegory, I do not mean the, the infinitely complex literary genre and the equally dense theological exegesis for which, um, for instance, the Old Testament becomes an allegorical uh, prefiguration um, of the New Testament, or literary th the literary theory that accompanies the genre that, ex that, that exalts or criticizes it, that amputates or consolidates the relations between signifier and its multiple signifieds. Nor do I mean the, counter the countless parables, sometimes charged with great political efficacy, in other arts where signs and figures point to ideas and resistances that could only be obliquely or opaquely told. What this tradition bestows upon us is a fully functional secular theology, a dispositive for transportation, a permanent flux of symbols that constellate in order to point out to and build a spectral double for another position, another agora, one that we cannot inhabit. Bridging over temporal rather than spatial or political partitions is of interest here, as are the totems, desires, forms of belonging and modalities of descent that are organized between them. It is this scenario and the logic of the foundational myth folded upon itself, impregnable, established once and for all, impervious and safely distant, yet fully effective in organizing its consequences that the Bradshaw paintings narrate differently. They are as much a product of an impregnable past as they are the product of now. The origin refuses to be confined to its place and accompanies us towards the future, or futures, ours, and its own, nebulously conjoined. They fracture the notion of origin that animates art history's cl classification of objects and subjects, precedents and lineages. The Bradshaw paintings invite us to a radical contemporaneity where foundation, the foundation re-engenders itself in the present, but, do, but does so as a split between something we have lost and something we cannot quite get. So we descend from the past that they stand for to the same extent that we allow them with insufficient but maybe recalibrated utensils to belong to our present, discourage our certainties and feed our anxieties. To the extent that we allow the past to speak for itself, even, in, even if in incomprehensible idiom, to equivocate, mumble, murmur, say nothing, repeat and think again. So should they be considered, should these paintings be considered the inauguration of a, gene, of a genealogy that never came to be, of an empty genealogical framework, or rather the terminus point of another paradigm, technological and spiritual, for the relationship between art and life, a paradigm that is necessarily incommensurate with ours? Are they a beginning that never ends, or are they the continued end of something that has been withdrawn, situated between, beyond our reach, but with which we could learn to coexist? In place of a prefiguration, a situation where we would imagine and represent mentally and discursively our incomplete selves performing in their temporal remoteness rudiments of symbolic activity, we find pure alienness and at the same time perfect contemporaneity. The origin is impure as the reciprocal, as the reciprocal contamination of the two elements that should have blended without a trace of um, of their previous disjunction. The story of allegory then begins with a death, as death as allegory is quite emphatically thwarted at Bradshaw. Allegory operates on two sides of a wall of correspondence, with each side aware of the other's activity, 
but with each side accepting the necessity that a semiotic barrier of some kind intervenes between them. With the Bradshaw paintings, the barrier is innervated, it's, it's traversed by blood, life, is vascularized, it is made flesh with another metaphor and circumvented. But with our neorealist neo allegories pandemically spreading through universal corporate advertising, the barrier somehow dissolves in its omnipresence. This is allegorical extremism, complicating the business of seeing through actual events so anomalous that they become mere names. An allegory without ideas, as is proposed by literary historian Angus Fletcher, asks how the idea can be resituated in the sea of ambiguous and vague possibilities at a time when all ideas seem to have been co-opted, corrupted, hijacked and diverted. At a time when precarious must pass for foundation and fracture must pass for consolidation. The words we should not defer into the past by, but make our own <coughs> will be akin to an oath a secular sacrament of holding totalities which are not one disjunctive holes. The oath institutes necessity without the justification of history. It does not adhere to previously existing conditions. An oath is its own inaugural moment via which a bind is sent into the world and is promised to it, sworn upon with all our resources of attention and imagination. Looking continuously at the space immobilized, petrified by the medusa of advertising and politics, looking always for the insufficiencies and incompletion to the holes in the gigantic surplus. To a kind of cancerous outgrowth, to refer another modality where cells, where cells replicate themselves. A cancerous outgrowth that amalgamates present and future, usurps the future. <coughs> that usurps the future from the present so that the future will too begin to speak our contorted metaphors and finally testify to our stupor. Thank you very much.